thank the Lord that you're here. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence with us today. Lord Jesus, every time we gather, and you are in our midst, Lord, we experience love in a unique and wonderful way. We experience transformation in our lives, for you are such a holy God. And when we enter into your presence gathered together, we know love in a deeper way through each other, through your word, and through your loving presence with us. Be present with us today, Lord. Um, I'm asking that you might open our ears and open our hearts to receive, open our ears to hear, Lord. Open our eyes that we may see and know the power of your presence with us today. And Lord, let us love in the way you love and understand what you call us to do. We pray in your holy and precious name, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at two things today. The first is the uh, two parables. This is week 18, days 2 and 3. And in the Gospel of Luke, we are studying chapter 16, verses 1 through 31. And the first parable that we're going to look at today is, we called it the crafty servant. But uh, we want you to know and remember that this is a parable of a dishonest servant, a dishonest steward. So the scripture tells us that this shrewd steward was dishonest to begin with. So we can keep that in mind when we talk about this parable, that he was dishonest. He was already padding uh, what he was taking in for his master. He was charging more money uh, than the master required for the item. And so he was skimming off of the top. We see that in TV movies today. Yeah. So the parable is not a real story, but a story that will give us a teaching and a moral. Now Jesus wants to teach us what is important through this parable and how do we take hold of the most important thing that he considers is the most important thing, why he came to this earth and suffered death and was buried, went into hell, rose again from the dead. Now all of that suffering and so forth is the most important thing. That's why he was born into this world and that most important thing is eternal life. So the second parable will also teach us about eternal life and about where we will go when we die. The thing to remember here is we will all suffer death. It is appointed every person to die, to lose this fleshly body, but that is the first death. And Jesus came that we might not suffer the second death, meaning separated from God for all eternity. So we look at the four last things again, which we've done many times. That's death, judgment, heaven, or hell. And we will all be resurrected. That's an important thing to remember, too. We are all going to be resurrected from the dead. But where will we spend eternity after we are resurrected from the dead? That's the big question. And that's what this parable is going to talk with us about. In Luke 15, our last lesson, we began looking closely at the parables of mercy. And this is a continuation in a sense. Luke 15 begins with these words. The tax collectors and sinners were all seeking Jesus' company to hear what he had to say. And Jesus begins by talking about mercy. In three parables we study God's mercy and grace for all people. Now Jesus wants us to know what his grace does for us. And, and this mercy that is given, what does it do for us? It brings us basically eternal life. This chapter 16 continues with Jesus' parables where he begins to teach more closely on eternal life. It is his mercy and, the, and his grace that gives us salvation. So we're about to enter this holy season of Advent soon here in the church where we begin to prepare our hearts for Jesus in two ways. Yes, we prepare our hearts hearts for the joy of Christmas. We celebrate that first coming, and the whole world celebrates that part with us, for sure. That first coming into the world as a baby. We celebrate uh, with gift giving to honor the greatest gift ever given to us, Jesus, the Christ, who came into the world. He was born so that he could die for us, so that we might live eternally. But this is also the season when we focus on the second coming, for Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. 
The question is, are we ready? We need to stand ready. And according to this parable of the dishonest steward, Jesus uses this parable to tell us we must do everything we can to attain eternal life. He did it all for us, but we must receive him. The dishonest steward was doing all he could to save himself from destruction. To him, that meant he wasn't going to have a cushy job anymore where he could dishonestly skim money. And he said, what am I going to do? Am I going to dig? I'm not strong enough. Am I going to go begging? I'd be too ashamed and embarrassed. I know. I'll make friends with the people. Now Jesus is telling us what this man is actually thinking because he knows. I'll make friends with the people. Maybe they will welcome me into their homes and I have a place to go and maybe work for them. They didn't know he was so dishonest. So he called the master's debtors one by one before him. And to one he said, how much do you owe? And the man said, a hundred measures of oil. The steward said, sit down and write your bond for 50. To another he said, what do you owe for the wheat? The man said, a hundred measures of wheat. The steward said, sit down and write 80. Now the master praised the dishonest steward for his astuteness, his sound judgment. So Jesus said this, quote, the children of the world are more astute in dealing with their own kind than the children of light. Whoa. So Jesus said, use money. Now we know in 1 Timothy 6, we're not supposed to love money and put it above anything because we cannot serve two masters. So in 1 Timothy, we know we're not to love money. It's the root of all evil. That scripture says, yet Jesus wants us not to use it, um, but we use it in a responsible and balanced way as his children of light. He wants us to use money. He gave us the money. He gave it to us to use to further the kingdom. We aren't supposed to hoard our money for when we die, but we must use it wisely. I like that little um, bumper sticker that says, I'm spending my children's uh, inheritance right now. Okay, go for it. But use it for the glory of God, okay? But we must use it wisely. That's the key. That's why the church calls our giving our stewardship. We get that every year, a stewardship drive. So we need to be good stewards, the church says, with our time, with our treasure, our money, and with our talents. God gave it all to us. That's what we have to remember. So everything we have, we need to be wise and astute in how we use every gift he has given us. We need to give glory to God in all things. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, In all things give praise and thanks to the Father, for this is his will for you in Christ Jesus. So we know that we want to use all of this for God's glory and praise him for everything that he's given us and use it for his glory. So using our time, using our money, and using our talents for God's glory is what's important. Now, having money and possessions are not a sin but a responsibility. And through proper use of them, we can give God's glory and build the kingdom of God. I've shared with you Monsignor um, Maloney. He used to be a pastor here from 1983 to 1993. He said, you will never find a U-Haul behind a hearse. <laughs> okay. So, because you just can't take it with you. We all know that. You can't take it with you. But there's a little story that I heard one time that there was this man who prayed. He, he knew he was about to die, and he prayed and prayed, and he said, St. Peter, I, I want to know, can I take it with me when I die? I'd like to take my gold with me. And he petitioned his guardian angel and said, ask St. Peter at the throne, can I take it with me? And he prayed fervently, and finally St. Peter said, okay, he can bring it with him. So when he died, he came to the pearly gates. They're real pearls, you know, these huge, beautiful pearls. And he had a suitcase filled with gold bars. And St. Peter told the angels and saints around him, open the, open the suitcase, let's see what he's got. Well, he has gold, these gold bars, uh, that he had allowed the man to bring with him. Because the man got to take it with him. But St. Peter said to the angels and saints, I just don't understand why he would want to bring pavement. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you see, the scripture says, Revelation 21, 21, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, 
them. The streets are gold. They are so pure gold, they are transparent as glass. So he brought his own pavement. Maybe he had a little side street or a cul-de-sac. So what is the message? And what morals can you get from this parable? There are five that I came up with. Probably you have more. But the sons of the world are wiser than the sons of light. In other words, if we paid as much attention as a Christian wanting eternal life as we do trying to get ahead in business so we can be comfortable in this world, then we would be effective in our holy stewardship uh, serving the Lord. Our second moral that I thought of was in verse 9. The lesson is that material possessions should be used where um, real and permanent values will make a difference um, as it affects eternal life, as it helps others. St. Ambrose said when he was uh, giving a commentary on the man who was going to build another barn, and the Lord said, this night I'm taking him, he's not going to build another barn. But uh, St. Ambrose said, the poor, the houses of widows, the mouths of children, they are the barns that last forever. Those are the treasures that we're going to uh, lay up in heaven for us. The third moral, a man's true wealth will consist not in what he keeps, but in what he gives away. And the fourth, of course, to me was the main moral, is that you cannot serve two masters. Once a person chooses to serve God, every bit of that person's energy and their time will be used all for God. And the fifth one is we either belong to God totally or not at all. So the Pharisees who were covetous, greedy, and lovers of money, the scripture said, they heard him and they ridiculed Jesus. And so Jesus speaks another parable. So our next parable we move into is a pretty scary one because Jesus tells this story using the names of the people. The rich man's name was Divas, it's Latin meaning rich, and the beggar was Lazarus. So basically, this is a story about the punishment of a rich man who never noted what was going on around him. So let's read this story. This is about the rich man and Lazarus, Luke 16, beginning with verse 19. There was a rich man who used to dress in purple and fine linen and feast magnificently every day. And at his gate, now this was his gate, the gate to his home, there lay a poor man called Nazareth, Lazarus. Lazarus was covered with sorrow. He longed to fill himself just with the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even came and licked his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In his torment in Hades, the rich man looked up and he saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus in his bosom. So he cried out, Father, Abraham, pity me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am agony in these flames. Abraham replied, My son, remember that during your life good things came your way, just as bad things came the way of Lazarus. Now he is being comforted here while you are in agony. But that is not all. Between us and you, a great gulf has been fixed to stop anyone, if he wanted to, from crossing from our side to yours, and to stop any crossing from your side to ours. The rich man replied, Father Abraham, I beg you then to send Lazarus to my father's house, since I have five brothers, to give them warning so they did not come to this place of torment too. The father Abraham answered and said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Oh no, father Abraham, said the rich man. If someone comes to them from the dead, they will repent. Then Abraham said to him, If they will not listen either to Moses or to the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. So, we need to remember about this story. 
And basically, it's about punishment. The punishment of a rich man who never noticed what was going on around him. Sometimes I'm like that. I don't notice what's going on around me, but we need to be aware of what's going on around us and their needs. I have a short story, and I wouldn't want to embarrass my husband, but he notices everything going on around him. I have some friends who do the same. They notice. And I'm just kind of oblivious walking along in this world, you know. <laughs> and we went to, we were at McDonald's this last week because I was too tired to cook lunch. <laughs> so anyway, um, as we were going in, I didn't even notice this, but there was a man sitting there. And once I looked back and wondered what Kenny was doing, I noticed the man was probably a homeless man, hadn't had a shower. And Kenny gave him a generous gift of money. And the man stood up, and this almost made me cry. He said, sir, sir, wait just a moment. So Kenny turned around and said, yes. And he said, I just want to tell you, you've made my day. This has helped me so much. Now, we don't often get that response, you've made my day. But the funny thing is that week, I heard it three times when Kenny and I were different places. So we need to take notice. So we can make someone's day. It might not just be giving them money, it might be giving them our time. One of the leaders shared, Karen, that she gave someone her time that she didn't feel she had to give, yet she gave it. And when she left that person, she felt as if she had been in adoration. So God calls us to do these different things, to give our time to people, to give our treasure, our money, and to give our talents when we can. So we just finished reading a few verses prior to this that Jesus said to the Pharisees, God knows your heart and why you do things. Sometimes I am so grateful that God knows my heart. And sometimes I go, oh dear, God knows my heart. <laughs> so Jesus said, up to the time of John, it had been the law and the prophets. But now, since John, who called for repentance by baptism to prepare the way of the Lord, the Messiah, who is coming, the kingdom has been preached. The kingdom of God has been preached. And the very first words out of Jesus' mouth in his public uh, ministry was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And this is what he said in our scripture today. By violence, everyone is getting in to the kingdom of God. By violence. What was the violence that Jesus was talking about? His passion. His suffering and death, which opened the gates of heaven for us and made a way for us to enter into the throne room of our Heavenly Father. The thing that touched my heart in this story of the rich man, Divas saw from far off and said, Father, Abraham. And Abraham answered, My son. Davis was a Jew, a son of Abraham, but that was not enough to allow him to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What gives us the right to enter into the bosom of Abraham, into the heavenly kingdom? What gives us the right to enter into the very throne room of God? Jesus the one whose name is above every other name. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved, and not that of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it is grace, undeserved, not by works, but by knowing Jesus and his love. By knowing love, by loving God, by loving others, will we open ourselves to grace. Grace is poured out upon everyone, but do we receive it? We need to believe in Jesus, and then we need to receive him as Lord. It tells us in John, in the first chapter, to all who accept him, he gives power to become children of God, sons and daughters of Abraham. In this morning's reading, there is a time for the Gentiles. We were told in the gospel today, 
And until the time of the Gentiles is over, Jesus will not come again. So our story ends, even if someone should rise from the dead, they will not be convinced. Isaiah said that they will have eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear. Let us ask Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit to help us open our eyes to see Jesus in the distressing disguise of the poor, like Mother Teresa did. Let us listen to Jesus, even those who are wounded, who needed our ear. And then let us follow Jesus. The moral of this story teaches us about our need for Jesus now. Because we must stand ready. Because the Son of Man will come at a time, an hour we do not expect. I was thinking about the Passover in Egypt when the angel of death was going through the land, killing every firstborn in the houses that were not protected by the blood of the Lamb. They were told by God to be ready to move. To be ready to move out of sin. To be ready to move out of captivity. Maybe you're in a captivity of some kind. Maybe someone that you love or even yourself might have addictive behavior. We don't know. What kind of captivity are we in? And are we ready to move out of that? Are we ready to repent and turn away from our sin? They were told by God to be ready to move. So they ate standing up with the belt around their waist. They were girded with, around their loins. They had sandals on their feet and a staff in hand. And they ate standing up. They were to be ready for when the angel of death will pass over. We are also called to be ready. Right now, while we can, be ready to give a testimony. 15 says, be ready to tell anyone who asks you why you follow Jesus, why you love Jesus. Be ready. Be ready to give testimony to those who ask. To those who don't ask, be ready when the Lord calls you to share with them. Be ready and stand ready for when Jesus comes again, because we're not going to know the day or the hour, we must persist in faith and keep the faith. And I've told you before, Father Hamsch, when he would say goodbye to you, he would say, keep the faith, but not to yourself. <laughs> Always say that. I loved it. So the faith, until we see Jesus face to face, we must keep the faith. Jesus asks a question in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be studying that very shortly, uh, chapter 18, verse 8. Will the Son of, when the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith on this earth? So I encourage you, stand ready, love him with all your heart, and follow his teaching. Amen. Amen. So Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your life and your life-giving love to us, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I have said to so many how I love being here with the women at Women's Christian Fellowship. It is so life-giving to me because you are here present in each believer. So I thank you, Jesus, for this lesson today. Seal it in our hearts that we might follow you and stand ready always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs>